Hey guys, my name is Kevin and this is Carrie, and welcome to the Bully Brave podcast where we talk about nurturing confident youth and creating a positive learning environment. With us today we have Patty Firth who is a teacher and also an influencer um, who, who talks about the broader strategies in teaching but also becomes very practical in her blog posts and strategies. So we'll be exploring that today. Um, now Patty, one, uh, I explored your website because it's quite comprehensive, it's got all this great information on it. And the one thing I want to know is who on earth is, well, what on earth is the Kudos Club and who is Count Snagit? Well, Kudos Club is a classroom management system that I developed kind of over years through trial and error in my classroom. And it kind of came about because I needed a way to reach my class that I was told was completely unreachable and really hard to manage. Okay. And it kind of came about that I needed a way to build community and trust and a sense of team because the class was very fragmented. Mm. So I needed a way to kind of build that sense of community and also have students that were working together as opposed to using something where students were competing against someone mm -hmm. else or competing okay. against each other or the teacher or uh, there was a rating standard. So um, I've used other classroom managements where you have students where you're rating them and they get kind of, you know, you have students higher on the rating scale than others. And I found that that just didn't really build the feeling that I wanted in my classroom. Mm. So I kind of tried a few things over the years and eventually Kudos Club kind of came to be. And what happens is we s have classroom rules and students take, we together we build uh, goals on how, what we can do in the classroom to meet those rules. Okay. And that's generated with myself and my students. And we come up with those goals and then we practice and we practice what it looks like, what it feels like, what it doesn't look like. Mm. So that all of the behaviors and the structures and the routines is very explicit as to what that looks like in my classroom. So I try to, instead of it being a behavior management system, it's more of a classroom management where we have rules, we have goals, we have routines that we have very clearly laid out and very explicit. So when we meet a goal, we get points on a little kudos club chart and then when we fill up that little point scale they unlock a prize and all, those are prizes that don't cost me anything they're things like wearing no shoes in the classroom for the day or they are chewing bubble gum that they bring okay. from home or bringing a stuffy or having a pajama day so they all choose what those rewards are but they don't know what's behind the lock mm. so when they fill it up it's kind of a surprise as to what mm. the prize is going to be but because I didn't want students to, in order to get those points, to be competing against myself or to be competing against one another or rating each other, some kids get the prize, some kids right. don't get the prize, I needed someone that we could kind of rally together <laughs> and be against. And kind Count of the, game of the gamification of kind of the classroom management. So ca it came to be Count Snagit, which is actually an anagram for count against. Okay. So I just mixed up the letters and it's count against. So most of the students never pick that up, but it's kind of my little secret that that's <laughs> what it is. <laughs> and I found like a, a picture of a typical cartoonish evil villain and he kind of just sits on the board and it's kind of the opposite, I would say, of like Elf on a Shelf where like he's catching you being right. good. Like he is the evil villain in my classroom. So I p said it that you know, he steals my coffee in the morning because I'm constantly forgetting where I put my coffee in the classroom <laughs> or, or, you know, I can't find something. So I'm just like, oh, that counts Snagit, move that thing again. And so we really make him like this character in our room and he steals the points. So if my class is having a hard time or kind of we've fallen off the rails and we're not really meeting a goal, he will steal a point from my class. After a couple of points, if he keeps stealing multiple points, so say if the goal in our room is to line up and walk through the hallway quietly because that's a really important routine that you mm -hmm. establish at the beginning of the year. If my class is having a really difficult time, well then Count Snagit will steal a point because they weren't able to meet that goal that particular day. Mm -hmm. If you start stealing one or two points, okay, well that doesn't mean that we need a consequence, that means we need practice time. Clearly we've forgotten what that looks like in our room, what's the expectation and we're not meeting our goal. So then instead of having a consequence, we practice. So we line up and walk down the hall, come back, line up, walk down the hall until we got it and we know what we're doing and then we can then meet our goal again because we've practiced that behavior. So the goal is to unlock those prizes mm. and to stop Count Snagit from 
stealing our points. Mm. So the kids, because they're grade fours and fives, they really kind of like that. They're, I have also have a high proportion of boys in my classroom, so they really kind of get the whole evil villain, beating the boss right. kind of mentality. So it seems to really work for my classroom in terms of motivating students. And it also provides, the Kudos Club provides a very, um, I guess, organized way to keep my classroom very structured. Mm -hmm. The routines are in place. We know what it's supposed to look like and we all work together. So my class is a team and we work okay. together and we we are successful together and the you know if we've got a few students that might be having a hard time, they're not overly consequenced or pointed out and I don't I'm not focusing on those negative behaviors but I'm focusing on the positives, choosing role models and we all kind of work together as a team. I love the idea that um, the expectations aren't handed down to them. That the expectations are something that you guys set together yeah. as a team, like you're saying, this is a mm -hmm. team, we are together in this. So that we're, we are setting our, our expectations and our goals together. It's not just me going, arbitrarily going, I want this to be accomplished. And how important is that, getting them engaged in that process? So I definitely have, I have five non-negotiable rules that we have in my classroom that I, uh, that I have for mm -hmm. them. And then we look at kind of what that looks like and how, what that's going to be. So there's definitely the idea of, sometimes I like to, akin because I teach government, that it's a constitutional monarchy. <laughs> so that they have, they have in the classroom that I am a teacher, I'm still in charge, it's my responsibility to make sure that rules are followed and structure and things, but then they also have an ownership too. That if they don't like one of the rules, we talk about it. And if they have an opinion, then I listen to their opinion. If they want something changed, they have that voice in the classroom in order to be able to do that. And we have our job boards also includes a prime minister. Okay. I'm trying to bring that curriculum right. in at any point in time I can. And that prime minister is kind of the voice of the class and they're the ones that kind of talk and share ideas. And we have those kind of class meetings where we talk about that and we say what's working, what's not working. And I think it's really important because the whole point of why we go into a classroom and why we're there is because students need to learn. Mm. That is the number one goal of every teacher, classroom, educational system is that students are learning. So that's my goal and I want to make sure that students feel that when they come in there that they want to be there, that it's not just my room. Mm. So even though I still run it like a constitutional monarchy, yeah. <laughs> that I am in charge, um, that they definitely have, just like the Prime Minister does, they have rights and responsibilities and roles within that classroom that are important as well. Awesome. And th setting up some kind of system like that, some kind of structure, you keep using the word structure, is, and how important is that? Because we've dealt with a lot of teachers and administrations, and there's kind of this back and forth we find when it comes to implementing such systems. Some teachers love it, they swear, but other teachers think, um, you know, that's, that's unnecessary, or maybe that's below them to use this kind of system, and they just want to begin teaching the kids and get on with it. So what, what's, what are your thoughts on that? I think there's definitely a difference between behavior management and classroom management. Okay. And I think that seems to be the key. So I like to think of what I'm doing as more of a classroom management system because it's about establishing group rules and norms within the room and it prevents, it's a more of a preventative way, it pre prevents the behavior. Sometimes there's systems that um, just deal with behavior. So right. they're more reactionary as opposed to preem preemptive. So do a, does a teacher need to? No, but some teachers just naturally have a way of being in a classroom where they can just control the environment mm -hmm. and control the structure and routine without them needing to have a system in place. I find with my students, I need to have something really explicit I really like to kind of focus on being transparent with my students in terms of what I'm doing. So Kudos Clubs allows me to do that, it allows me to be very transparent about what the rules are, what my goals are, what I expect of them. And it means that throughout the day when there's other chaotic things that are happening because it's a split and everyone's doing something different, we fall back and we rely on that structure and routine and we know what's expected of us. So I'm not dealing kind of at the back end, dealing with a lot of behavioral management issues mm -hmm. at the back end. So it's kind of more of preemptive. So I think it kind of depends what you're trying to do. Right, right. Um, I think 
kind of if you're looking at, I know there's a lot of administrators that kind of toy with the whole, what do you do for a classroom management? Right. I think it should be more about building a community and belonging and um, kind of building those group norms within that cult and building a culture within your classroom. And I, I feel like at the beginning of the year, those tools are super helpful in setting the rules. Because at the beginning of the year, there can be a disconnect. The kids come in, they have their own expectations. So you're spending the first month setting healthy boundaries, saying, this is what's expected for me when you're in my classroom. So those, these classroom management tools, whether it's, whether, whether it's the, the, the kudo system or anything else, they, they provide this gateway to setting those expectations for the kids. Yeah, definitely. I think that there's, I read a quote, I can't even remember where it was, but if the students aren't doing what you expect, it's probably because they don't know what you expect. Mm -hmm. So really being clear with students about what I want, what I want it to look like, what I want it to sound like. We practice, we do it a little bit. So if you're doing, you know, you want them to build independent work skills, then I, of, I often will hear teachers say, oh, my students aren't independent. They don't work independently. Well, I think most students can work independently. Right. If any parent of a student can sit there and watch their kids kind of zone out on a video game for hours or reading a book or focusing on building a Lego set, they can focus and work independently without you. But it's how do you structure that in your classroom? So it's give them five minutes. Do we do five minutes? Great. Next time it's six minutes. What does it look like? What does it sound like? Make an anchor chart. So it's in writing. We know what it looks like. We can read the rules. We practice what it looks like. They're so clear on what your expectations mm -hmm. are that there's no guesswork. There's no trying to figure out, oh, will she want me to work like my grade one teacher did? Does she want me to work like my grade two teacher? Because every teacher is so different. And I think for us as teachers, it's okay that we're different. It's great that we're different. It teaches such great skills for students mm -hmm. that we all manage our classroom differently, but we can't just expect that when students come into our room. That they know right away. Yeah, right. they're not going to because you're going to have, I might want my pencils sharpened only during nutrition break. The teacher last year may have said, you can sharpen your pencils whenever. It comes down to that very simple, what do I do? Yeah. How do I sharpen a pencil? Mm -hmm. yeah. There's so many, little things and you're talking about 30 kids in a class you can't really function if yeah. all 30 kids think that they can sharpen their pencil whenever you need to have a system in place yeah. so you put those systems in place and then it prevents problems later on i think and i would say i would think that if you if you set those clear expectations like you that you're doing is that a student will or students will strive to meet those expectations because they know exactly the goal they know exactly um, but you have to set them. You, you do have to set them, um, but they want to strive for that. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah. Setting a culture of high expectations in your classroom is really important. It doesn't really matter in terms of their cognitive profile or what's happening. You have that awa you have your awareness of what all of your students are dealing with, but I think setting that expectation in your classroom that this is what I want and you can do it and I know you can do it means that they will rise to the occasion. Is there... Um, is there ever, you know, that we set too high expectations for our students that they're not going to meet? Oh, definitely. Yeah. There's times, especially when you're just getting to know them. And I think that's also the key is getting to know who your students are and getting to know what their strengths are and what their areas of needs are so that you can constantly be adjusting those expectations. So I think aim high and then <laughs> adjust, adjust as adjust. you're going. So nothing's set in stone. It's not like we have to get, so oh, okay, you know what, we're going to talk about this as a group. This is, we're going to have to scale this back a little bit. Yeah, and I think that's that's the whole point of being transparent, right? Is you say, okay, this is what I want. Like I, we've had times where I've said in writing, okay, I want one draft piece of work for you by Friday. And some kids are like, awesome, I can have a draft by Wednesday. We're good to go. And some kids are like, well, for two weeks. Right. So I think it's, you know, you start it up with, I want something every week. And then you kind of, you look at your students and you kind of say, okay, I can get this. I had one student that was writing beautiful pieces of work, but they were so detailed. There was no way she could give me that level of detail due by Friday. Mm. So she needed more time because of the level of detail she was putting in. Whereas others needed, f you know, by Wednesday, they needed to write me two because they were writing simple pieces. And so it's getting to know, you kind of set that expectation and adjust. And you just adjust based on the conversations you have with your students and say, what is it that they're wanting to do? 
what is it that they can do and listening to them saying, I can't do this in time. Okay, well, when can we have that done? What are you working on? What are you struggling with? And really listening and learning about your students as individuals, I think. And, that, that, that. and that's what I hear. I hear that there's, there's a class expectation, but then we also have to know our right. individual kids. Absolutely. Because the class expectation may be too much for this child at this point, mm -hmm. at this point in time. Or, you know what? This child can go a little bit more with this expectation. So really knowing and and using their strengths to to get them to be the best that they can be Absolutely. within that structure. Yeah. I think this next question very much speaks to that. This balance between a sense of community and a sense of individualism. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that's something. Hearing hearing you talk from the beginning, the first time you're setting your expectations with with your classroom management or just your teaching style in general, you're setting a sense of community a sense of teamwork, a sense that it's us together, not you against you against you against you. Mm -hmm. So how, like, how important is that sense of community? But then how important is it, is it also to give them their custom learning plans or custom objectives? By having students focus on their strengths, it builds a better community. Okay, okay. So when I have some students who are really great at writing, mm. well, let's capitalize on that because I know I'm gonna have students that aren't gonna be great at writing. But those students who aren't great at writing might be great at tech. Well, it just so happens that the person who's doing really good at writing might need some help with tech. So it's really looking at what are your strengths. That's and great. I think if you go to the adult world, we all don't do the exact same job. We specialize mm -hmm. and we, we build on our strengths. We do jobs that we are good at because it's our strength that we focus, you know, we go to university and we focus on one area of study because it interests us. It doesn't mean that we can't, don't have to do all that other stuff. You still have to pay your taxes, you have to do math, you have to go to the course, like you still have to have that, but you can rely on your strengths. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you look at a sense of community, you need to have, you don't need to have all identical robots. Okay. You want to have students that are really strong at other things and you want to identify that their strengths are different things and we focus on those and we build on it and we say, wow, he's so good at using tech. So let's use that. So if you've got a tech problem and I'm busy conferencing with students, well, who are your tech gurus that you can go to? Who are the people that are really great at spelling that you could ask yeah. to spell something for yeah. you? How can you rely on your students as experts within your own space? And because they're going to other students and not always coming to me, it kind of positions that I'm not necessarily the center of the learning environment. And, and, and that's yeah, life. Facilitating mm -hmm. it. Yeah, and, and that's I'm life. Because in the adult world, like you're mentioning, you're not siloed. Right. Like you are partnering with somebody who has a skill set where you're, ma you're maybe not the best at, and you're working together to create something. Yeah. It's very common. So yeah, you're, you're simulating a very real life environment by having that kind of. Having them process. outsource. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and grouping them. So I try to, you know, after September, you get to notice, you get to know who your students are, mm. and you conference with them, and you learn what they're because we're very goal focused. We learn what their strengths are and what you know other people's strengths are, and then you group them. And I'm very transparent with them in saying, I'm going to group you with this person because you're great at spelling and she's great at descriptive words. And that's something that maybe you're struggling with in your work is descriptive writing. So I want you to work with these two people because you need to work on your descriptive writing and you need to work on spelling. <laughs> so yeah. trying to pair those students together and recognizing that I think everybody's good at something and that when we all focus on our strengths, it helps to pick up those areas of need because we can use our strengths to help support areas of need and we can rely on the other experts within the community in order to help us compensate. I'm not a great speller, and I model that for my students. Right. So I will say, I'm not a great speller, so what do I do? I don't just pretend I'm great at spelling. I use my phone, or I have my piece of tech with me, or I look it up, or I make a mistake and don't worry about it, and put it up on my board anyways, and deal with it later, and white out, and things like yeah. that. So there's things that, there's things that we're good at, and there's things that we're not good at, and it's okay to be really honest about this is what I'm struggling with, how do you help me? So one of the big things I struggle with is getting my, um, with many teachers, is getting my attendance into the office administrator before 9.15. And I very, I struggle with it because I get busy, the kids come in, totally forget to do it. Mm -hmm. So I'm really honest about it. So I find that one kid in my class that has the biggest potential to annoy me. 
Right. Because they just, they're those ones that are just like constantly asking questions. They're constantly there with you. Well, that's the best kid to give the attendance job to. Right. Because that kid's job is to grab my iPad and follow me around the room until you do it. Until I do it. And that could be a behavior for them that could be something that they would feel ashamed about. Right. Well, I've turned that into a strength because now they are the person that helps me with my goal mm -hmm. because I need them. I need them yeah. because they're really good at reminding me and they're really good at kind of being in my face all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's a strength. It's just like you Not my strength. <laughs> no, 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 for sure. What kind of uh, um, uh, behavioral shift have you seen since using this uh, format, this community uh, format with your class? Because I'm assuming that, that you haven't always used this, this program. So what, have you seen a shift in behavior and connection with the students with, with using this type of um, strategy. strategy, this yeah. yeah, this tool, this community? My first year teaching was a disaster. <laughs> I think as is everybody's. <laughs> I think so. I think you got to go in and, and recognize that. It was an absolute disaster. I thought for sure, let's use, you know, I had this system with red, green, and yellow cards, and every kid had one, and that there was a behavior, you flip the card, and by about February, it completely fell apart, and I had all of the attention was on the students that were kind of against, they were the counterculture within the classroom, mm -hmm. and it was building that that was getting prominence because that's who was getting the most attention mm -hmm. of my time, and um, I really needed to kind of switch that focus, yeah. and I moved from that first year, I moved into more of a consultant role through the ESL department within our school board. And through there I saw, I got the benefit of going into all of these different classrooms and seeing how so many different teachers ran their programs. So when it was time for me to go back into the classroom, I knew that I needed to kind of pick and choose all the best pieces that I had seen in all of these other amazing teachers' rooms. And that was the one kind of thing is when kids felt that they belonged, when they felt that their teacher cared about them, when there was trust, there wasn't the behavior. Mm -hmm. And it always struck me as different that because I would see certain students in different teachers' classrooms that they would be different with different teachers. Yeah. And I always wonder, well, why, what is, the, what is that linchpin that is making that student behave here and not here? Or one year they're having a great year and then the next year, and sometimes it's just a matter that they just don't connect with their teacher. Yeah. <laughs> that happens. I've definitely had students where it just wasn't a good fit. But for me, that was kind of, I, I didn't want to repeat my first year. And it's constantly yeah. trying to not repeat my first year. And I had a great um, EA come into my room halfway through the year my first year. And he kind of helped refocus and taught me the importance of why routine matters. Right. And the fact that that routine that I didn't have a lot of established routines mm. was part of the, the mm. failing and focusing on the negative as opposed to the positive in the classroom. So when I went back to the classroom, I knew that I needed to kind of do something and we tried a little bit and every year I kind of changed it until okay. now I think, I think I'm pretty happy. <laughs> well, I, th I think that's incredible to speak, uh, speak to about your, about how, you know, you recognize that something wasn't working and instead of trying to force the same thing and that from your first year you realize that I, I have to there's, there's got to be a shift here I got to change mm -hmm. this um, how hard uh, from an educator standpoint is it to to have that self-reflection and go there something that I'm doing is not working how can I fix this oh there was a lot of tears if yeah. you asked my husband there was a lot of tears that first year there was you know you feel like you're a complete failure and it's the idea that everything that you thought you knew um, about how you would manage your class, because you think going into teaching, it's all about the curriculum and you just want to be able to teach. And without the management, there is no teaching. No. You can't teach. And so there wasn't a lot of teaching going on that first year. And I didn't really know what I was doing. I was kind of thrown in to the last minute into the classroom. And well, you kind of have to, you either have to grow or you, got to yeah. get out and so so if you had to if you had to go back and redo your first year or advise your younger self and other any other teachers out there who are starting off it's there isn't as much support as you'd think for a first year teacher there's little to none and 
you're very much left on your own to really scramble and, and learn and ask people and sit down with ex established teachers. So how would you advise your younger self or any other young teacher out there? Um, first thing is don't expect to be great. Okay. The first year, kind of as much as I want higher, you know, aim high. Yeah, you want to aim high, but you're not, it's probably not going to be great the first year and that it's okay um, if not everything works out. And I think to rely, take some time and really plan. So if you do have the luxury of getting a position and knowing ahead of time that you have it, really take that time to plan what it's going to look like. Write out your routines. Mm -hmm. What do you want it to look like? Look at the structure. Look more at managing the class because the curriculum will follow. Mm -hmm. You'll get to it. It'll ha there's a lot of supports out there for curriculum. You can buy curriculum materials and you'll yeah. be okay that way. But really focus on managing that classroom and building what that's going to look like and figuring out too what's going to work for you. So something that might work for me, you can't just kind of take it out of the box and plug it into somebody else's classroom. You've kind of got yeah. to make it your own and get to know who you are as a teacher because if it's not natural to kind of how you would naturally do something, then it doesn't really feel authentic. And I think that's hard for a first year teacher because they've, yeah. not, they've yeah. not done that. Yeah. Um, and I think too, the idea that getting that time to supply teach where you're right. going into Support. other, when you're going into other classrooms, you're seeing how other classrooms are structured and organized. The same thing that I got to see going into different classrooms as an ESL teacher was great. My benefit is I got to see the regular classroom teacher teaching in that classroom. Uh, as a supply teacher, you might not get that luxury, mm -hmm. but if you're there on a prep, go into another classroom. Don't just sit in the staff room, go into another classroom and just offer to help and be there watching the teacher teach mm -hmm. and take that immerse time. Yourself, immerse so, yourself. Immerse yeah. yourself. Be a real student of what it is to be in a classroom and just hope and pray that you can get through the first year, <laughs> I think. Uh, this, is, this is awesome. And the one thing we've noticed when talking to educators, especially admin who have their finger on the pulse of where education's heading, it's less, it's much, much less about memorization mm -hmm. and understanding and, and knowing you know, the planets per se as an example, but about you know, critical thinking about being a global citizen, about social justice, about understanding mm. the context of situations because the jobs nowadays are not plug and play. They're not, it's not a decision tree job. It involves creativity, problem solving. So mm. how are you seeing that effect and how do, you, how do you adjust your curriculum and your style? So I definitely use student-centered inquiry okay. um, as much as possible. Um, I'm, it's kind of transformed my teaching in my classroom, mm. looking at being the students are kind of the focus and it's what are they going to be pursuing. So really list, giving them voice and choice in my room in terms of what we're learning about, looking at those big ideas of the curriculum and looking at where I see those sparks. So setting up situations where I have opportunities to see their interest and their spark and where they get that kind of, oh, okay, I'm really interested in this. And so then we kind of dig deeper into that topic that every single year it might not be exactly the same. I definitely have, I think there's a balance. You can't just go, you can't just go totally into everything's student centered right. because they still need that background knowledge. So I think you have to kind of have a nice play, but you can build that background knowledge while also being honest about what their interests are. So looking more at you know, setting up and building kind of a wonder wall and giving them provocation materials and having them ask questions and then building on that and making learning goals and success criteria and then talking about what it is they want to learn and then kind of filling in those gaps as the teacher right. in mini lessons and through conferences and then allowing them to explore further. So letting them kind of drive the learning and instruction. And for me, it's also me meant that I'm not planning as much at home because I'm doing it with my students mm. real time and they're working and so I have time to assess because I'm conferencing with them and assessing right in the moment. So I'm not taking a ton of stuff home marking. I'm not spending my Christmas break kind of planning what the next um, culminating activity is right. going to be because right. it's 
what they They're want. Organic. Yeah. It's yeah. it is more organic. There's still there's still time for me to kind of there's certain lessons and experiments yeah. that we've got to they've got to teach. There's definitely a time for, you know, rote learning, multiplication tables just sometimes need to be memorized. Yeah. You need to know your basic facts and there's time for that. But you also need to look at where students are interested mm -hmm. and they have to feel ownership and responsibility in what they're learning so they can be more engaged. And it's not always fun. Engaged and fun aren't necessarily synonymous, yeah. um, but that they want to do what they're doing and they see a purpose and a reason for everything that they're doing. I think the other big thing I want to talk about is the dynamic of a split class and how it's a completely different world than your mindset and how you approach it. So heading in and now knowing how to run a split class, what would be some advice you'd give to a teacher who's, you know, next year they find out, hey, you're doing a 3-4 split or a 4-5 split. What are the things they should, they should gear up for? Don't freak out. Okay. <laughs> that's a good one. I think that's the first thing. You're given a split and the, your first thought is, oh my God, I've got two what curriculum. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I've got two <laughs> curriculum I've got to cover. Um, I like to think of it that it's, it might be slightly more, but every, every classroom probably in this province is technically a split grade with the mm. amount of special education needs and behavioral right. needs of an ESL that are in your room. You're teaching multiple grade levels at once anyways. The benefit of a split is that you're kind of given permission to deviate from the one standard lesson. So in a split, it forces me to differentiate from my students. So I have to do, I have to teach four, I have to teach five. So I might as well just throw in the grade two and the grade three <laughs> expectations right. as well. And it also allows me to bury those students that require lower grade level expectations, bury them in plain sight. So everyone's doing something different in my room. So no one really notices whether it's a grade four thing or a grade five thing. It forces me as a teacher to be a better teacher mm -hmm. because I can't just rely on a textbook and teach one lesson than they do. And I, it makes me kind of push boundaries and not necessarily fall back on standard traditional teach, teach, test right. kind of instruction. And I think for so many teachers, they see it and they just get overwhelmed and they get so bogged down with the curriculum that they forget that it's still a class and it's the same class yeah. you just happen to have different learners and they have different labels but it's still your room and you can still teach it i think for language and math they can be taught together language and math are learning on a continuum so you just kind of treat it like a train ride and they get on you kind of teach, 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 and they get on where they need to get on, they get off when they need to get off, and you keep the train moving, and you kind of have different kids coming on at different points, and you make sure that you're, what you're doing is accessible and it's open-ended so that it's not so linear, and using inquiry is great for that because right. who is better at meeting their needs and knowing what they can and cannot do other than the student themselves? Mm -hmm. So if you say, I want you to write something, and then they write it, well, they're not going to, if they're working at a grade two level, they're not going to write at grade six level. They're mm. going to write at a grade two level. So then let's work on that and push them towards that level. And as we keep pushing more students to write better, well, you're going to stop pushing that one student when they've reached kind of their limit and you're going to keep pushing the others. Social studies and science, there's big ideas that are common amongst the grade levels, grade three is similar to grade five, grade four and grade six have a lot of commonalities. And there's often, so because you've got that, you can see and combine them in different ways with big ideas in terms of the environment is a big issue. So you just, in your instruction, you flip flop. Mm -hmm. I find flip flopping my instruction. So I do 20 minutes with one class. Well, they, okay. and then they do an independent activity. Then I teach the other grade and they work with me and then they do an independent activity. That works for me because we can just kind of constantly go back and forth. There's not a ton of prep. I've done centers before and doing centers kind of, there's so much prep that's involved because you're prepping five centers for the grade mm -hmm. fives and five centers for the grade fours and you've got all of the stuff and there's a ton of prep and work for me. Mm -hmm. And I simply don't have time. I've got three kids at home. I don't have time <laughs> to be like planning 10 different centers at home. So, um, you just kind of do what you need to do and just treat it's a class right. and you just treat it like a class and you'll get through it and 
you know, slow down and speed up as you need to and try not to compare yourself to a straight grade classroom because right. you're not going to be able to do everything that they're going to be able to do. Yeah. And you kind of have to go at your own pace based on the needs of your student. But I think first, don't freak out. Don't freak not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> not and, a big deal. And when, when you do have to provide a lesson to your, to your one grade and then turn and metaphorically turn your back on one grade to address the other, are there any tips and tricks when you have to do, when you have to separate the curriculum in still managing the other grade as you're addressing the, the other one? And that's why I think routine is so important. Okay. So I re really rely on that routine and I also rely on the idea that my students need to achieve and that there will be students that just sit in the corner and might not do anything. Mm -hmm. But there's natural consequences to that. When you sit and do nothing, when it comes due date time and you have nothing to show, well, your mark will reflect that. And then you have to go home with your tail between your legs and show your parents that you didn't do anything. And then, well, that's a learning experience. Mm -hmm. And that sense of, oh, well, this doesn't feel good. And, you know, not necessarily softening the blow, but giving that sense of reality that when you don't do the work, you don't get the reward mm -hmm. of having that mark or that success. But then how do we do better next time? Right. That has to be the next key. You don't just want to let them fail and leave them there. Yeah. But it's, okay, so you didn't do it. What are you going to do differently next? Yeah, How are you going to do different? Too. Yeah, so teaching them independence and getting them to move forward and getting them to kind of push those boundaries, I think, is really important. And, you know, creating things for your students that you know that they can do independently. Mm -hmm. So research, having, you know, they can all use tech in my room, I rely on that heavily. So some of their independent tasks are, they're working on doing a research section. They're working with a partner, often a partner that has a mismatched strength right. so that they can help one another. So if I have a student that struggles with reading, chances are there's gonna be a student who doesn't struggle with reading. But I find that they can kind of work together and I, they know what independent work looks like because we've practiced it so much. So they know what it looks like and then they can get things done and it's just kind of back and forth. Okay. I love that you uh, pair up the kids uh, based on their strengths um, with each other. Because I know in a class, if you tend to say, okay, find yourself a partner, what do they all do? They all go to their best buddy, mm -hmm. right? And they tend to have their little groups. Um, but by you saying, no, 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 okay, you need to work with this person because they have a skill set that you don't necessarily have and you have a skill set that, that they need as well. Mm -hmm. So they're, I don't want to say forced to communicate with each other, but something that maybe necessarily they wouldn't have partnered up because they're just not in the same uh, friendship circle. Um, now you're, you're, you're having them work together and create that commonality and that bond. Um, can you speak a little bit about that and what that does to the culture of your class? So sometimes when you say to your students, okay, you know, choose your partner, and they do, and they all choose their best friends, and yeah. it's great. I kind of let it happen at the beginning of the year. I'm yeah. like, choose your partner. Great. They all choose their best friends. Okay, get your work done. Oh, well, guess what? Nothing happens. <laughs> yeah. And then nothing happens. And then they're like, oh, well, we didn't get anything done. Okay, why? Why right. is that? Oh, well, we were talking. Right. Interesting. <laughs> right. You were talking. Why were you talking? Well, because you're best friends. And of course you want to talk. So just because we're best friends doesn't make us great partners. Mm. And I'll use the example of sometimes, you know, sometimes my husband and I, I love him, but I can't always do this work with him as my partner on like, say if we're painting, well, we can't paint the same wall at the same time because we both have different, our own ideas, ways of doing stuff. Mm. So we're really great, but we have to learn how to work with one another. So working with your best friend might not be the best thing because you're going to be having too much fun with them. So try to pick somebody who you do work with. Now, sometimes you really do work well with your best friend bending on the task because there's a lot of trust there and that maybe that task requires that trust. Mm -hmm. So it's really evaluating the effectiveness of your partnerships and letting that failure happen. So letting them pick that partner, letting them fail and going, is that the best person who you should be working with? It doesn't mean you're not friends. Go be friends outside at recess. That's great. But are they the best partner? Because your number one job in this room is to learn. And if you're not learning, you're not succeeding. Mm -hmm. So if your partner spends more time chatting about stuff, then you're not accomplishing our most important task, which is learning. And we need to reevaluate that. So sometimes they need to take a break from that partner and sometimes they really want to go back and work with that partner. So then they really have to start negotiating those roles and identifying 
how are they going to work with one another? Mm -hmm. how, maybe it's, there are some times where it's just, we've said, you know, your North Pole, your South Pole, you should never be anywhere near <laughs> them because all you do is talk. And, and it never works. And we, I'm just honest in negotiating that, saying, no, you're North Pole, he's South Pole. Don't ever work together because the two of you are too chatty. Yeah. And, it's that, and that's okay. And being honest with them is that's just not a good partner for you. Pick a different partner. And sometimes it's a matter of I let them pick partners and I see that it's not happening and I go, nope, done, new. And you know they have to go pick a new partner because it's not working. And they quickly learn, we talk about how to pick a new partner, what you look for in a partner and what makes a partnership successful and why we should choose a partner who's going to make us be successful and what do we look for in a partner. And so really having those explicit conversations about how do we work together and why do we work together? And it's not just a popularity contest mm. because that doesn't accomplish our goal and our goal is to learn. Mm. So I absolutely love that you, that you have those types of questions with the kids. You know, uh, what makes a good partner? You, 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 you really have them thinking, you know, outside the box, mm -hmm. you know, not just, well, I just want to. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but what is our goal? What is our objective here? So how are you going to make your time here the most effective? Mm -hmm. And I, 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 th I think it's beautiful that you ask those questions. I think the last thing I really want to touch on is the, when there are situations, whether it's bullying or whether it's unwanted behavior, or mm -hmm. toxic behavior for the class environment. What are your strategies to deal with it? I understand my question is very broad yeah, because, <laughs> because yeah. there can be a lot of stuff that happens, a lot of different types of things. Right. So how do, you, how do we make sure that when something does happen, we're addressing it properly and we're almost nipping it in the bud, but also empowering this student to handle it on their own? So I think there's two things. What I like to do is because I function as a team, and so it's the team mentality. Um, we also say if you're working kind of counterculture, then you need to be off the team for a little bit. Okay. So all of the things we do in our classroom and all of the fun or the engaging things, well, that's not necessarily a requirement. I mean, I can, I can still make you learn through a textbook and through, you know, you just kind of do your own thing. So we talk about if you need a pause from the team, if you need to kind of, you're on the bench kind mm -hmm. of thing. And if it gets to that and you've got somebody that's constantly working kind of counterculture and there's a power, they're trying to power struggle with you as the authority in the classroom, I think it's important to kind of take them a step back and say, okay, you need to decide if you want to work with us or against us. And having them kind of sit out, and this is just a conversation that happens privately between you and that student and they're just kind of they're going to take a break for a little bit. They're going to take a back seat, they take a break. And with the idea that at any point in time, they can come back and they can ask to be back and to join and to, and they look at, well, you've got to come in, but you've got to follow the rules that are in this group if you're yeah. going to be part of this team. And also understanding that that student might not, when they're kind of out and taking a break, they're also not impacting the success of the rest of the class. Mm. So, because you don't want that one student's behavior to constantly be kind of giving my counts and get points or whatever. Mm -hmm. If it's that one student, they're kind of out, they're taking a break, they're on an individual program, they're earning their way back, they're working towards being part of the group again, and there's a lot of kind of supportive management there. I think when you see a problem that happens right away, we might not always be able to stop it mm -hmm. and to address it right away. So I think immediately is separate and, and separate the issue and then find the time where you actually have to deal with it. I think sometimes you don't, you don't always have time. So I think it's important that you kind of pause it mm -hmm. and then go back to it. And I find I like to be really kind of open and honest with what I'm seeing and what I have really frank conversations with the students about this is what's happening, this is how it's being interpreted by others, this is what they're seeing, this is what they're saying. Sometimes, you know, it feels like you're having a Dr. Phil moment <laughs> where it's kind of like everyone's having, you know, time on the, where everyone's kind of airing out grievances and especially, you know, sometimes when you're dealing with, you know, drama that might be happening in the class. Um, but really getting that time to hear everyone's voice and dealing with the issues and then kind of understanding that they can come to you with concerns or problems and you will listen when you find the time to deal with it mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and all of those things and um, I think having this 
having a structure kind of does prevent a lot of some of that and also pinpointing the power structures that might be happening in your classroom mm -hmm. so that you can anticipate where the problems might be because you can often walk into a classroom and you can see those power structures milling mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. you can see which students have power which students don't who's vying for attention who's not and really kind of understanding the power structure within a classroom and using it to your advantage as a teacher as opposed to kind of working against it also helps as well Phenomenal. Well, do you have any more questions? Or? No, I think that's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I think your answers were, were great. Yeah. Some great Thank practical <laughs> piece of it. Very practical, which Thank is necessary. Um, as is tradition on the podcast, you can provide the Be Brave tip of, okay. of, the, of the podcast, something that you feel educators with your experience within schools should be considering more of or should have their eyes open to, something, maybe a philosophy is your, of yours. I think the biggest one is something I mentioned earlier, where is if they don't know what you, ex if they're not doing what you expect, mm -hmm. it's probably because they don't know what you expect. Right. So to really give them that time to practice and to really be very clear with what it is you want to happen, what it looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like. So don't just assume that they know what you want, but make it very clear so there's no misinterpretation of what it is that you're expecting. Um, and know that it's it's okay to constantly be reinforcing those routines. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you so much. I know we learned a lot. Yes. And I, I know the viewers will have picked <laughs> up quite a bit of tidbits as well. No problem. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. We'll hopefully see you again. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.